bring it into Egypt. So being Roman is in fact a big deal. But the Jews grew up with the same idea that they are a special people, they're God's people, they were given the law, and nobody else has it, so being a Jew is a big deal. And both of these things are true, but the problem with people who think they're a big deal is that everybody else finds them obnoxious. <laughs> and countries with citizens who think they come from countries who are a big deal are often found obnoxious. And you may have experienced this if you've interacted with, for example, Americans or French or Brits. But I won't comment on that anymore. So when you put these two things together, there's, there's some friction. And in fact, in the city of Rome, they passed laws against the Jews, and they expelled them at least twice. And when this letter was written, they had just allowed them to come back in again. But so now there's this church with Jews and Romans, and the question is, how do you manage this? Um, so Jesus was Jewish, the so Romans must be thinking, do I have to become a Jew? Do I have to get circumcised? Can I still eat pork? Uh, you know, how does this work? Does it mean the Jewish Christians are more important than the Roman Christians? And if you think about the New Testament, this is one of the main dynamics that's going on the whole time. It starts with the birth of Jesus and these Three wise men go to Herod and say, I hear that there's a new king of the Jews showing up. And he goes, oh yes, king of the Jews, you say. Where is this going to happen? <coughs> and right from the beginning, there's conflict between Jews and Romans, and it goes throughout the whole New Testament. The tax collectors, the Jews working with the Romans and their traitors, and right up to the last minute when Jesus is about to be crucified, Pontius Pilate asks him, so you're, you're a king, is that right? Oh no, no, it's not that kind of kingdom. It's all about Romans versus Jews. Clearly Paul is worried about this. And he says he wants to come to Rome to explain everything, but he can't get there. So he writes this letter, and the goal of the letter is to set out the correct way to understand God and the world and each other and human nature. No big deal. <laughs> As a result, this letter is long and it can be very hard to understand. So don't be discouraged if you're following along with it and you find it difficult. It is difficult. But first week, we looked at Romans and Craig pointed out that the message was for everybody. Jews and non-Jews means everybody. It's a universal message and this is amazing because he's saying no more Romans versus Jews. And in this passage, he says it again four times, verse 22, all who believe. Verse 22, again, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Verse 23, all have sinned. Verse 24, all are justified. So you can throw out all that stuff about being a special people. All people are special. So this is radical. Nobody thinks like this at the time. So it's a universal message. And then last week, Ben, told us the first part of the message itself, which was about the law in the Bible and how it's a stumbling block and it's a dangerous book. Because it says that there's a law that comes from God and it's not about what we think is right and good and just, but it's about what really is right and good and just. And the law really doesn't care what we think or feel about it. It's just out there and true and we know it. What kind of bad news so where's the good news? Well, it starts here, and it begins with these two amazing words, which is, but now. But, when we say but, it means what came before is correct, it's true, and at the same time, what comes after that is going to change what you think about what came before. So I'll give you an example. There's a little boy, and he meets a bully. And so he looks at the bully, and he says, you are big. But, my brother is bigger than you. So it's true you're big, but what I'm about to tell you is going to change what you understand about being big. So what before is, what came before is important, but it's not the whole story. And you can't understand everything until you hear what I'm going to say. But, and what now? This is the moment here, really, when the whole of world history changes. Starting with this time that we're living in, everything is going to be different. A revolution has occurred, a new regime is being set up, and we're the ones setting it up. It started in Paul's time, and we're still doing it now. 
It's a different way of functioning, thinking, judging others, judging ourselves, looking at the world, acting in the world, understanding the present, the past, the future. But now, it's the fulcrum of history, it's the turning point. It's getting to the top of the mountain and moving over the ridge to the other side and walking into a new land. But now. Then Paul goes on. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. So there are these two things, the one side of the mountain and the other side, the before and the after, the law and apart from the law. Until now, we functioned according to the law, but starting now, we can function apart from the law. So the old way is still true, it's just that now we understand it differently. And he says the law and the prophets testify about what's happening now. They already knew back then that the way they were living under the law wasn't going to last forever. Something was going to transform the law. So now we're not throwing it out. We're building upon it. We didn't totally understand the law before, and we still don't understand everything now, but now we understand more, and it's becoming clearer what it's all about. So what is the law about that the prophets were talking about? Basically, in this passage, it's the righteousness of God. It's all throughout the passage. Verse 21 says, the righteousness of God has been made known. Verse 22, the righteousness is given through faith. Verse 25, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness. Verse 26, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. It's all about righteousness. What is righteousness, the righteousness of God? It's God's justice. It's God fixing the problem of injustice. It's God making what's wrong right. So God sees the horrible things that people do and he has promised to address the problem. Last week, Ben talked about the Bible being a dangerous book. It's a book where you can hear people calling for justice and God promising justice. And sometimes we read about the time when God is going to bring justice, when he's going to hold people accountable for all the horrific things that they've done. And this is called the day of judgment, or even scarier, I think, the day of the Lord. And it's a very scary thought, a dangerous thought. So to illustrate this, I'll ask you, have you ever heard about this thing called teenagers? Yeah. Maybe you've seen one, or maybe you've been one, or you know somebody who has one. But sometimes parents go away and they leave their teenagers alone for a while, maybe even for a whole day or more. And sometimes, I'm sure none of us have been involved in this, but children call up their friends and say, my parents are gone, come on over, I'm in charge. I'm having a party. And so everybody goes over and it's a blast and the music's playing and they're smoking and drinking and maybe other things. And what's the worst feeling in the entire universe when you're a teenager pretending to be an adult acting cool? It's looking out the window and realizing that your parents came home early. <laughs> and whatever evidence there is of what your friend and you have been doing has to be eliminated in a matter of seconds, and that's impossible. That's the day of the Lord. <laughs> It's the moment you have to face the truth and be accountable. Now, I'm trying to make a funny example, but of course in reality it's not funny. Because we're not talking about a party. The injustices of the world is not a party without parents. It's poverty, exploitation, it's genocide, it's environmental catastrophe. Now, can you imagine having to have God the Father, the parent, come home to find what we've done to the planet he created? and the people he made in his image. That's the real day of the Lord. The prophet Amos writes this, I know that your transgressions are many and your sins are numerous. You oppress the righteous and you deprive the poor of justice. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. What will the day of the Lord be for you? It will be darkness and not light. 
It will be like a man who flees from a lion only to encounter a bear. So the law tells us what's right and wrong, and the prophets tell us that one day God is going to give everybody justice. And that's a huge problem for us because none of us want justice for ourselves. Because as we heard last week, not one is good. No, not one. And here again in verse 23, Paul says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's like the kids back at the party without the parents. Everybody's in trouble. Everybody. Maybe you weren't drinking alcohol. Maybe you weren't smoking marijuana, but you weren't supposed to be at the party. The party itself is illegal. No one is good. No, not one. And now we may say at this point, yeah, that's, that's a bit harsh. I'm not that bad. But of course, it all depends on your point of reference. If you're thinking about humans, then okay, it's true. You're probably not one of the worst of us. But if the point of reference is God, it's a lot different. And the law is God's righteousness. God's justice demands not doing things we know are bad. So for example, here in France, we have laws, and one of them is called the Code de la Route. It's the things you're supposed to do or not do when you're driving. And it does not, it does not say this. It doesn't say, don't go over the speed limit too often. It says, don't go over the speed limit. And if you don't believe me, you can try it out for yourself. I can tell you where specific radar traps are, which I've run into. So try it. Just try it. Drive past the radar nine times under the speed limit, and then the tenth time just above the speed limit, and then wait for the letter that will come, and see if it says, Dear sir, you respected the speed limit 90% of the time, and that's pretty good, so we're not giving you a fine. That's not going to happen. <laughs> Well, here's another example. Imagine a plane that flies from Lyon to New York, and it flies just perfectly 99% of the time. But the last 1% dives into the Atlantic Ocean. That's no good. 99% is a lot of good flying, but it's still no good. So imperfection is a big problem. And if we're honest, we know we're not anywhere near 99% good. We're always choosing to do what we should not do. And we know we should not do it, and we do it. And Paul even says this about himself. So indeed, it is a dangerous book. Luckily, the letter does not end there. It says, but now. So yes, the day of the Lord is coming. But check this out, verse 22. Righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So we get we receive the status of somebody who has obeyed the law even though we did not obey the law. We get righteousness for free. It's called justification. Verse 24 says all are justified freely by his grace. It's a gift. Back to my party. Your parents come home and you're there in the house, your friend's house. It's an illegal party. You're standing there with a bottle of beer in one hand and a cigarette in the other hand. And by the way, this makes me think I actually witnessed this once. I was in a pub in England, and my friend was on the other side of the table. And he was a very tall, good-looking guy, and had a beer in one hand and a cigarette. He was the king of the pub. And I was looking at his face, and I saw his face go like this. And he said, Mom! His mother had made a surprise visit from Boston. She went all the way to England and he took his beer and went, This is yours. He took his cigarette and said, This is yours. And she said, No, Steve, those are yours. So the same, the same situation could be happening. There you stand, like my friend Steve, with a beer and a cigarette, and the music is playing and you're dancing, and then the door opens, and there's your friend's parents walking in. And your friend's dad has fire in his eyes, and he looks around the room like this, and he starts on you. And he walks up to you, and he says, You're okay, get out of here, go home. So you put down the bottle, and you stand up the cigarette, and you walk out the door into the cool air of the night, and it envelops you, and it feels like freedom. 
And you think to yourself, how did that happen? I, I did not do anything to deserve that. And it's true, you didn't. You just received righteousness freely. It was just a free gift from your friends' parents to you. Now, question. Do you now believe that your friend has a cool dad? <coughs> yes, you do. Now, again, with God, and it's a lot more complicated, of course. The sinning we're talking about is more serious, as I said before. But another difference is that we don't actually see the parents who own the house. We see the house we live in this world, the beautiful world. But we're still at the party and they have not come home yet. But if we believe that the dad is cool, and if we believe that the parents are understanding, and we trust that if they come home that they will act in our best interests, then that's pretty good. And that's faith. Faith is a confidence about the way things work, a kind of knowledge that applies to the future. Or it's an awareness or an understanding about how God goes about things. We don't understand the details, but we get how it works in a way that other people may not. So perhaps when you were a child, for example, you knew when dinner was, you knew what time was dinner time. Maybe you were too young to tell the time, but you understood how things worked. So you trusted that dinner would be ready about the same time every day. I, I remember my brothers and I would hear the sound of someone coming up the walk, and we knew that was our father. He was coming home from work, and that soon after that it would be dinner. We didn't know what our parents were doing, but we had a child's understanding about how things worked. Likewise, we know something about God's character. We know what he's like. He hates injustice and he loves mercy. We know he's in charge and he's working things out even when it looks bad. So we call this faith. We have faith. So in the Jesus story, we see that it corresponds to the way God works. It makes sense that he'll figure out a way to have both justice and mercy. We have faith that it will all work out somehow. But verse 22 says, Righteousness is given by God to us through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Or in verse 25, Atonement is received by faith. Or verse 26, God justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Faith is a sensibleness to what God is doing to save us. So to conclude, we said that but now means everything we said before is true, yet that truth will be understood in a different way from this point on. So Paul writes in verse 25, in his forbearance God left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Sins are wrong, everybody knows this, Romans know it, Jews know it, sins need to be punished, and that's not going to change. Now we understand that God became one of us and took our punishment for us. Verse 26, he did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and to one who justifies. To be just and at the same time the one who justifies. And this is the good news that we didn't fully understand before. God takes care of everything. He's both the guarantor of justice and the giver of mercy. The punisher and the punished. It's an almost incomprehensible thought. But basically God says, I got this. There's no need for you humans to do anything about salvation. You're not capable of it in any way. So this is a gift. Just take it. You're free. Go home. And in verse 24, this whole process is called redemption. And I'll just end with that because there were a lot of slaves in Rome. Everybody either knew about slavery or was a slave or owned a slave or slaves. So the Romans knew about slavery, and the Jews were also very aware of slavery. Every year they commemorated Passover when God freed them from slavery in Egypt. And 
redemption is when somebody pays for a slave's freedom. So one day somebody comes in and looks around and says, well, your name Ben. And he said, yeah. And he says, you're free. Somebody paid for you, you can go now. And that's what God did for us. He redeemed us. So here's a final question. How would you feel if you were a slave? You have no freedom. You don't choose what you can do. But you were freed by somebody. Maybe a relative you weren't even thinking about showed up and just paid for your freedom. How would you react? That's what happened to us. God redeemed us. So we are free from sin and death and judgment. And how should we react? Now? How should we react to that? Perhaps an appropriate reaction would be to say this. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. You are right in your verdict and justified when you judge, but do not cast me from your presence. Restore me to the joy of your salvation. My God, my Savior. Amen. Now Diamond is going to come and read the song. So, <clears throat> Psalm 51, verses 1 to 5, and then 10 to 17. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from, the, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your way so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my Saviour, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I will bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, you God will not despise. This is the word of the Lord. Yes. Yes. Yes.